So one of the things that we hope to do with this podcast is to have our um, cheap cultural critical hot takes. And so um, we were talking about the distinction between VR and 360 video. And um, the cultural criticism of VR, of course, is that it um, submerges you into this isolate, alienated world where only you exist and all of your interactions have meaning and um, you're kind of like the literal center of the universe. And then 360 video is the other neoliberal truth of having infinite choice. You know, you can look wherever you want, but then as Kat points out, it's, it's the illusion of choice as opposed to choice itself. So there we've ticked that box of uh, cultural criticism, uh, cheap hot take cultural criticism. So we're in, uh, we're doing our playthrough now. We got August um, playing. That was who was coughing earlier. They have a terrible cold. Because Ben's, Ben's too cheap to turn on the heat in here. It's freezing. And to pay for medicine. <laughs> and to pay for medicine. It's getting pretty Dickensian up in here. <laughs> well, if the people we did art for would pay us. <laughs> then maybe so, we could. Our, little chi- Timmy, our children wouldn't be dying of tuberculosis. <laughs> little Timmy wouldn't be dying of goddamn TB <laughs> in downtown Toronto. <laughs> I think it's the Spanish flu, actually. They got the Spanish flu. And we didn't even get to go to Spain. <laughs> um, okay. Well, there we go. So, so our our friend Augie is doing a playthrough of our Resource friend. right now, and Augie's actually sort of Augie has been um, he's been testing he's Augie has been performing this uh, this VR piece for us since the beginning. <laughs> it's true, unpaid uh, child labor. <laughs> um, the first opening in 2017 at Mayworks, Augie and Roman were the activators. The, yeah, they were sort of doing the choreography of it, which is beautiful. Um, do you so in resourced um it's a like we mentioned before it's a series of interviews and each interview has a different level um when we did the interviews originally who uh who are the interviews with ben so the so resourced is, is based on interviews with uh kathy crow and roxy danielson they're both street nurses so kathy crow kind of is a pioneer of street nursing um, a dominant theme of the uh, frontline work is um, the worker um, leaves the institution and goes into public spaces, goes into homes. Uh, the, the You'll hear the expression, meet people where they're at. So in Kathy's case, uh, she meets people in the street and ministers to them in that way. Um, and in an institutional context, and, and, her, and Roxy was kind of her protege. Um, then we interviewed Stephanie Archambault, who works with street and drug involved mothers in um, the Jane and Finch area, or did at the time. Uh, and she's a social worker. Uh, we interviewed Monica Forrester, who um, uh, works at uh, Maggie's and is the indigenous coordinator there. Uh, Maggie's is a sex worker advocacy program. Um, and they offer a range of services um, around health and housing and best practices and support. Uh, and then Lee Chapman, who is a registered nurse. Um, she's been an activist in the fentanyl crisis, and she helped start the safe injection site illegally at the time. Uh, so punk, very and very kind of like early union. If we don't like the laws, we break them until they're better laws. Um, and she started the safe injection site at Mars, Moss Park with friends and colleagues. And so the interviews um, talk about the work that these different frontline workers do uh, and uh, kind of like their experience of it. And then talk about the people that they're serving and, and, and the, um, their interpretation of the experience that those people are having. And then we think about that through the lens of policy and budget and kind of like the technocratic and bureaucratic um, uh, uh, issues that impact uh, the sort of work that they're trying to do. Um, and we wanted to, we conducted these interviews in 2018. Um, and when we conducted the interviews, uh, we took with us our Xbox Connect, which is a um, 
an accessory for the Xbox 360. It's very old now. It's like 10 years old. Um, that you can use for 3D scanning. Um, and so we use it to create 3D scans of the interviewees' uh, bodies. And uh, the the our, our, our fellow VR studio at the panel we were just on, they also do f- photogrammetry and scanning, but hilariously with the most expensive equipment Cutting that edge. you can get. And then we have this like 10-year-old dirt equipment um that therefore necessity like was part of the reason why it necessitated a more abstract uh aesthetic in the game that we totally. ended up making we created th- these scans of the participants bodies and then in vr we use the uh spatial information from the headset and the controllers of the oculus uh, headset that we're using um, to map the user's movement on with the uh, the 3D scans of the interviewees' bodies, um, and then that's pr- that sort of forms the the uh, core mechanics of our game or of the documentary, and then you go through these different levels, not only moving yourself around in space, but you're also moving the uh, bodies that are mimicking or mirroring your movement around in space those bodies being the the scanned image of mm-hmm. the people who we interviewed mm-hmm. maybe kat you can talk a bit about aesthetic as we kind of watch augie play through the levels yeah um you're missing if you're just listening to the podcast right now you're missing the visual component which uh includes ben's child augie playing uh the the sort of the walkthrough of the demo of the game uh, and that in, in that there's a lot of, in the actual imagery that is present in the game, you have a lot of, uh, the background's often just a flat color. Uh, you have really, um, sort of simple, uh, representations of like hand out hands for your VR controllers that are, uh, in, in a, a, a platform, as I mentioned earlier, your each level sort of, uh, you kind of traversed various platforms that um, are populated by the the uh, 3D scans of people. And again, these scans are very rough in the sense that they're kind of blocky outlines of, of human forms, but certainly not uh, indicative of any like individual uh, facial characteristics or and sometimes not even indicative of like body forms. But uh <laughs> Uh, the, the, the sort of decision with that was to b- both like a budget thing, what with we had uh, working with what we had uh, as far as like what the Xbox Connect uh, could actually translate into a 3D model um, and how much time we initially had to develop this. Uh, I came onto the project after its initial demo demo at the Mayworks 2018 festival. We spent um, Mayworks is a labor arts festival in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Which, Shout out Carol Conde, Carl um, Beverage for inventing that, for bringing that about. It's well, a really good invention. My the, favorite invention. In I like the telephone. <laughs> Light bulb, pretty hot as well. But uh, so th- that <laughs> that's what. Uh, resource began as a um, a, an installation for that and in it and that version there was a much more bare bones sort of VR very punky there was no real there's no interaction at that point I think besides mirroring besides the 3d scan bodies mirroring Mm -hmm. your movement and uh, as I came on the project um, we all uh, we all began to sort of decide what how we would like uh, these the the interviews to be visually represented. So in when on on Thursday during the event, we we often use the phrase like interactive metaphor as a way of describing the gameplay where you're engaging in the le- the level. Let's call it a level because it's like using a video game. Uh, engine you're engaging in the level and you hear the audio play of the interview and there's things that are going on um that are directly um there's the the things that are happening interactively like what's what is for, what sort of things are for popping instance, up this level 
Yeah. Um, is an interview with Stephanie Archambault. And as she talks about not only sort of helping people who are experiencing trauma, but also vicariously dealing with that trauma herself, the whole time water is just slowly raising and eventually engulfing you. Um, that's sort of our ex an example of what we are sort of thinking of as the like interactive metaphors. And then the, yeah, it's the idea of like staying afloat, I guess, being something that you voice during the interview. And keeping your head above the water. Yeah, keeping your head above and the water. Literally what Augie's <laughs> doing very well right now. Oh, no, going under. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, buddy. No. Uh, so that's, that's the... Uh, that's a way where we're trying to make the user feel like they're there, you know, there's something to do. There's a very, there's a real like uh, relationship between like what the user is doing and what they are hearing as opposed to just uh, not just because like 360 videos as we see can be very powerful or as we saw during the event, but um, there's as people who are like formally in, in, interested in like what the VR medium can do, we're trying to push uh, push those connections and push what does it mean when uh, or what can you how how does it change the content or the experience when you can uh, actively do something in the world where you're hearing these these stories being told I think Kathy had a good question that because we, we talk about kind of the motivation for the project and we talk about the aesthetic of the project and then Kathy Crow was actually able to show up at the event. Kathy Crow was one of the people we interviewed and she was kind of the first level that we chose because in her interview, she had that great, what, what's the... Oh yeah, so charity is vertical and solidarity is horizontal. Which has, see, this is like, this is like anorexic ruins or techno-linguistic structures. It's kind of like one of these very evocative uh ways of putting something so it mm -hmm. sticks in your head and and her question was like okay so we make these vr experiences that have like an explicitly political cant to them and then what happens what do they do and i and i thought that was a really fair question i didn't have an answer for it no no it, that's like the most existential question mm -hmm. well that's i mean that's the question of are you make like if you make political art capital p a political art what are you yeah what is that what are you doing? And we kind of are guilty of that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I time. mean, every time I write a grant application, it's like, what are the, what are the, what, how would you describe this? Come back here, Og. Og, you don't walk so far away. You're going to pull down our whole setup. Og is testing the limits of VR right yeah, now. Yeah, Og is definitely the way. <laughs> best user I've ever seen of VR. Or Yeah, for sure. I'm glad that we've had the luck to have Augie's performances in our <laughs> VR game multiple times now. It's very nice. Um, but yeah, we are explicitly kind of like trying to do political art. But I think that we also have like, if, if we're not cynical, we have very conservative expectations about what can be done with that, I think. Yeah, indeed. Um, because, yeah, like we said before, we're not particularly um, enthusiastic about its ability to engender empathy in others or make it actually feel like you've walked a mile in another, another uh, soul's shoes. Um, as if that was a guarantee of anything. As if, <laughs> as if yeah. Uh, we, uh, the, the question of what it does, though, like why is sort of the question of why even make political art, but then maybe even more specifically, why do we think VR is a good context to create political art in? And the best we can sort of answer is like as a sort of propaganda for the for the uh, things that we think deserve propagandizing. <laughs> yeah, I, I was listening to um, the, the New York Times podcast and they're talking about the Me Too movement and talking about um uh Weinstein and then a, a kind of trajectory where Weinstein inter like is the is the flashpoint for the me too movement and then uh Brett Kavanaugh like either breaking its back or frustrating it dramatically and then one of the reporters comes to the conclusion that um it doesn't have like it might be shifting political discourse but the people who are in power um, the lawmakers and the politicians continue to exert the same inf the, the same influence that they have done. They haven't absorbed whatever message whatever message the uh, Me Too had to offer. Would you say it was a simulacra of progress? Uh, that's maybe I would say that. Maybe I would say that. And so I do think that um, discourse functions um, 
by accretion and it can kind of have its toxic or leaching effect but i i, I don't think that there's a tangible way to measure the impact of i guess what, what, with the sorrows of young werther right by goethe mm -hmm. there was a marked uptick in suicides mm -hmm. Again, dissociation, the only thing that art can cause. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we'll see when the Joker movie comes out. Oh, yes. <laughs> the sorrows of young Joker. Yeah. Uh, but it's it, already out, so maybe there's some... Li let's live stream watching that. No, we met the Joker. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's good. Oh, yeah, that was the other thing that happened. It we got very chaotic. University. some real chaos energy outside of Ryerson. <laughs> we are having a chat with the people we were on the panel with and all of a sudden like a badly dressed joker appeared in our conversation circle He's eyeballing us in this kind of like jejune performative As gesture they were being filmed by their like accompanying filmmaker Confer. yeah it, it the makeup wasn't on point at all i just didn't like the invasion of my personal space by a promotional uh, like costume character that's true i don't yeah. think they were actually promotional they no but it was too that's cheap worse to though they were just doing like grassroots promotion for the dcu <laughs> they're self-owning um so in wrapping this up maybe like one of the last things that is go interesting going off the question of what does it do what does political art do what is the end of it um the also the question of like the politics of this art, artworks specifically um, it just in terms of like telling stories, telling stories that aren't your own also um, telling like telling other people's stories and how to involve other people when you're telling their stories. <laughs> Cause that was my hot take. Yeah. It's a good my, one. My hot take. What, well, not what you're saying, but like, but no, I'd say your, that. Your, yours is good. You liked my hot take. I, yeah, totally. I can I, see. This is a very affirmative group. Yeah. <laughs> um, was basically like that the, what is consistent with all of the work that was represented at this conference was that it's narrative. That is the technology that is sharing empathy as opposed to the, the VR uh, media medium itself. Um, it's the oldest technology. <laughs> I need a knife and I need narrative. <laughs> we should we should do that. We should make a song and yeah, call it's pretty it pretty good. Um, before forks, there were only knives. I Whoa! Like that. Think about that. Um, Kat, do you have anything to say on that? Of like the specific poli politics of the work itself, telling people stories, being artists who tell other like telling other people stories. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, I guess I see us going up against like making work, this, this particular work in VR was just producing something that's a, a little bit different than what else is available uh, in VR at, at this moment. And that's not necessarily the, so, that's not really the reason why it's being produced, but it's uh, as like, as we continue to show it to people and uh, expose people, either expose people to VR or expose a new kind of VR experience to people. Um, yeah, I find it like a continue, it, it able to continue my interest as a, as a collaborator on the project. Um, it, it, yeah, it was interesting. The, they, at, when people were asking, what do you do? What does, what will, what will VR do? That sort of looped into a question about how will we, can we see it as a, as a learn, as a tool of learning or a tool of education? And that's, I guess that was, I was just sort of sitting in my thoughts about that as, uh, as, as a technology of, of Facebook as, if it enters the classroom, <laughs> what the consequences will that be of uh, if, if people do believe it can have so much more uh, uh, or if, if people think that it, it is some sort of empathy machine, if it will replace a, the if it will replace a human teacher, it's very a very scary consideration. If you look at all the other uh, cuts that the well, specifically the Ontario school system has been um experiencing uh, and it's just putting technology more technology between students it's so funny it's it's such a trip to think about the emphasis on presence and reality in it when it feels like the, the, there's all i can see is the technology and the and the 
financial constraints and mm-hmm. the and even just like the basic um, perceived obsolescence <laughs> that happens with this uh, medium that to me makes it anything but present. Yeah, yeah, this is the fourth generation of device that has come up since I started working with VR in like 2016. Um, so we've kept poor August. Augie quits. Augie's on child. strike. I, I don't. I think Augie is operating as if there are child labor regulations in this apartment. <laughs> um, Little did he know. Uh, but um, that, I think that ends our playthrough. Let's if, do plugs. If you would also like to play through the uh, the VR documentary resource that we made, you can come to uh toronto media arts center uh this thursday evening when we will be there or you can also go friday saturday and maybe sunday for rendezvous with madness uh that's the workman arts uh art festival and there will be a a number of different works there and ours will be one of them um and you can uh play it just as augie was playing it so well here with us and there are still places of there's still spots available at the brandscape if people are looking to rent um, private, semi-private, and co-working spaces. Anything else to plug? Yeah, the uh, so um, you are able to uh, follow the podcast now on um, SoundCloud. Uh, the, it's available at soundcloud.com slash art dash work dash play. It'll also shortly be available on Apple iTunes. Now it is. Now it is. It is. Jonathan got the uh, notification that it is available on Apple iTunes, which means you can use the wonderful Apple podcast app to find us as well. Um, you can uh, Follow the studio at Twitter at Speckwork, on Facebook at Speckwork, and on Instagram at Speckwork as well. If you want to be notified of the Twitch stream, um, follow us on Twitch at Speckwork. Okay. So long, sweet universe. Farewell. Bye.